Hello, I'm Rod Butler. Welcome to Let God Speak. The world is changing rapidly and in ways that many of us do not like. There is more and more control over our lives by governments. Conspiracy theories abound about the age agendas of those in charge. Yet we have hope in Christ's love revealed during this most exciting time in history. Stay with us as we discuss final events and Christ's complete triumph in the great controversy. On our panel today is Cassie Solano and Uriah Sengist. Welcome Cassie, welcome Uriah. Before we commence our program, we're going to ask the Lord in prayer to guide us, so please bow with us. Gracious Father, we're going to discuss the final events in the great controversy that result in sin being forever removed from existence. We ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom for ourselves and also for our viewers as we discuss this important topic and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, the Bible gives signs to let us know that Jesus is about to return. We have the signs listed in Matthew 24 about false Christs with their signs and wonders, wars and rumours of wars, and increase in natural disasters. We have the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation revealing the activities of the dragon, which is Satan and his organisations, the sea beast and the earth beast. And we have hope as we see events unfold as predicted and know Jesus' return is closer than ever. We are, however, told, we are, however, told Cassie, about another event which is going to happen before Jesus returns. What's that? Mm. Well, we're told there is going to be the worst time of trouble ever in human history. We read about it in Daniel 12, verses 1 to 2 which say, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So it's clear here this time of trouble precedes the very end time. And this time of trouble, well, we hear about it in other parts of the Bible too. In Jeremiah 30, there's a description of what this time is like. It says, 30 verse 5 says, For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labour with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labour and all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. It's pretty, pretty heavy when you think that it says there in again, Daniel 12, 1, it says a time such as never was since there was a nation ever, even to that same time. It's pretty hard to imagine with all the atrocities we see today, something worse than what's ever happened. Mm. Uriah, when does, this, when does this happen? What's the timing of this? Well, as we just read in Daniel chapter 12, uh, it happens when Michael, who is Jesus, uh, stands up and he sits in judgment. And when his judgment is over, he stands. And um, there is uh, biblically necessary for a judgment to take place before Jesus comes and gives his reward. Let's read Revelation 22, um, verse 11 and 12. In verse 11, it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So that is the end of that judgment that declares uh, the righteous from uh, uh, the wicked. And then in verse 12, it says, And behold, I am coming. Jesus is speaking here. I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So after Jesus uh, examines uh, the lives of those that are being judged, he determines 
uh, by their own choices, the nature of the character and the choices that they have made. And then when he's coming, he's coming to bring that reward. So the time of trouble occurs before Jesus comes, but after uh, it has been determined what which side is. everyone is and what their reward will be, which is what we mm. call probation. So between proba close of probation and the second coming of Jesus is the time of trouble. Okay. <clears throat> now, Cassie, going back again to Daniel 12, verse 1, and it talks about a book. What, what book are we referring to here? Mm, well, the book it's referring to is called the Book of Life. When we accept Christ and make the decision that we want to follow him, our names are written in the Book of Life. If we wander away from Christ, then our names sensibly are removed from the book of life. And Revelation 3 verse 5 describes this. It says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And this isn't something that just appears in Revelation. Jesus also refers to this. I'd like to turn to Luke 10 verse 20 which says, and nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yes. Mm. So it's pretty important we have our name in that book. It is. Now, you're right, going back to the timing, before Jesus returns, we have the seven last plagues. And we have this time of trouble, which they seem to coincide what must our preparation be to be able to go through this period unscathed? I'm told that, that trials do not uh, make character, but it, 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 it tests, it reveals uh, character. And if we turn to uh, the first John chapter three, verse two, the Bible says, beloved, now we are children of God and it is not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We can only rely on Jesus. And it would be a great mistake for a person to rely on themselves to be able to endure the time of trouble. But our relationship with Jesus, the growth that we experience in our character now prepares us for that time of trouble. And it will not determine our character, but it puts our character to the test because before Jesus comes, we would have been as close to Jesus as we ever would have. And we would be able to uh, withstand the time of trouble because of our grounding in our relationship with Jesus. So it's all about us having our eyes focused on Christ all the way. That is correct. Cassie, what assurance and hope do we get from the Bible that we'll be sustained during this time? Mm, thankfully, we get plenty of assurance. So we think of a time of trouble surpassing anything in the world. Obviously, we need something that's firm to hold on to. So I like to think of when we think of this time, the example of God protecting the Israelites during the 10 plagues on Egypt. Plus, many of the Psalms also promise us deliverance, so we don't have to look into the future and see this time as something where God will not be there, because of course he will. So I'd like to read just one of these many promises. Psalm 27 and then verse 5. It says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Yeah, it's clear that God will take us from any trouble that we're in, including this time, in places somewhere safe. Mm, so our, our hope are in the promises of God. Absolutely. That's where the faith comes in. Do we believe it or don't we believe it? That's what it says. Do we believe it? I just want to read a, a verse here because the, the culmination of our hope in the promises are that Jesus will return. I'm going to read um, from Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. And it says, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, this talks about Jesus' return being our blessed hope. Uriah, apart from the obvious that we'll be with Jesus, what other aspects of the second coming bring us hope? I believe one of the most painful human experiences could be the loss of a loved one through death. 
And many people fear death because they think that it's the end. Many, at many funerals, people cry and say, I will never see my loved one again. But this is the hope and the promise that uh, God assures us in Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, there's a beautiful promise that's made here. Uh, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Now, yes, Jesus is coming to meet us. That's great. Mm. But here is the beautiful promise. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So those loved ones who have died and gone on before, uh, who died in Christ, as well as those who are faithful until the end when Jesus comes, they will be reunited to never part again. Mm. And that will be a beautiful day of, uh, of restoration mm. and of, uh, of, of uh, reunification. Also in uh, John, John chapter 14, uh, verse 1 to 3, there is another beautiful promise uh, that is made. Jesus is, is speaking and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Many people are troubled today in this world. If you believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So no matter what uh, trouble what is, is facing us on this side of heaven, there is the assurance that Jesus will come again to take us to a better place mm. that he's preparing for us forever. Mm, beautiful. What I like about um, John 14 verses 1 to 3, in verse 2, there's that really personal touch where it says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Mm -hmm. Jesus is speaking right to us that he would have told us. Yes. How personal, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So Cassie, those that are looking for the blessed hope have hope. We have hope. What about those that don't have their faith in Christ? What's their, what's their feelings? Where are they at? Mm, well, sadly, they have no hope because Jesus is the one that brings us this hope. He is what we have our faith in. So if you haven't chosen Christ, you haven't chosen to have this hope. And in fact, it's choosing against God and against Christ. And that only can lead to fear and guilt and condemnation, which yeah, in any sort of time, you don't want to be having those feelings. Mm. But even more so if you don't have anything to look towards, that you just think, oh, well, you know, I only have all the bad things I've done and all the things in the world. So eventually they will have eternal loss mm. from not choosing Christ. And when we think about this end time specifically, if they're looking towards it, they're not looking towards it like we do with the hope of, oh, we'll see all our loved ones again it's terrifying for them because they know this isn't what they have. And this sort of mindset is described in Revelation 6. Um, I'd like to read verses six, mm. 16 and 15, which say, And the kings of this earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So they're terrified. They are. They're just mm. wanting anything to happen. You know, very, having the rocks sad. fall on them. Very sad. Mm. You're right. Just going back to the great controversy theme here. It started in heaven and it spills over onto the earth. And here we have all this happening on the earth. Is there a wider perspective to this controversy that we need to know about? Uh, there is. The great controversy is not limited to earth. And um, you've already said very well that it started in heaven. Mm. And there was that division in heaven in terms of those angels that fell. But it and sort of got dealt with, didn't it? They were cast out. Yes. And it has to culminate because the story at this point is not yet ended and there is an audience that's watching what is happening here and um, Paul gives us a glimpse of this in 1st Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9 where he says for I think that God has displayed us the apostles last as men condemned to death for we have been made a spectacle to the world 
both to angels and to men. And that word world, in uh, the language of the New Testament, the, the Koine Greek, is the word cosmos, where we get mm. cosmology from. And cosmos could mean planet Earth, but it could, also means the, it could also mean the material, the whole material universe. Mm. And I rather suspect that this is what Paul is referring to here because he says, we are made a spectacle. God has displayed us, so we are being observed. And he's saying, a spectacle to the world, the universe, as the highest level, then to angels who are in heaven, and then to men on earth. So there are lots of people who have a vested interest in the choices that we make for God here because we are on display, our lives are on display, our character is on display, not just to fellow men on this world, all of the angels and all of the created universe. Mm. It's powerful, isn't it? We don't think we, we think we're alone, but we're part of a wider audience. Um, Cassie, we spoke earlier about Christ comes back and the dead in Christ rise first. They go to heaven. While they're in heaven, what's happening on the earth here? Mm, well, it's only sensible to think, oh, the redeemed have left, that it must be the wicked who are still on earth. At this stage, the wicked are dead, which is important to think about because the next thing that happens is that Satan and his fallen angels are imprisoned on the earth for a thousand years, which we find in Revelation with no one left to tempt because the redeemed are all gone and the wicked are dead, they have time to reflect on the results of their sin. And this is described, this entire process, in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, which say, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So while that's happening, what's the condition like on earth? Mm. Well, re verse one refers to the bottomless pit. In Greek, this is the word abyssos. The Old Testament is in Hebrew, but the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uses the same word in Genesis 1. In verse 2, it's used to describe the earth before of all creation. So it's obvious the earth during these 1,000 years reverts back to a destroyed condition, analogous to how it was before creation. Right, so it's in a pretty bad state, basically. Yes. So you're right, what are the um, what are the redeemed doing during this thousand year period? So we read in Revelation uh, sorry, first Thessalonians chapter four that the dead in Christ and those who are yep. alive and remain will be caught up with Jesus and they will be there for one thousand years. But they're not just there twiddling their thumbs for one thousand years. That's a long hard. time. No. You know, evidence is extremely powerful in determining truth. Someone can say something to you, but you kind of might not be sure. But when you show them the evidence, it is compelling uh, what the truth is. And if we turn to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, the Bible tells us what will be happening during those thousand years. In my Bible, that heading, that section there is, is headed, the saints reign with Christ a thousand years. And verse 4 says, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received this mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So during the thousand years, the saints who are in heaven with Jesus will be reviewing the books, the, the evidence of those who had an opportunity to accept Jesus and they rejected him and those who made their choices to stand by Jesus. So nothing will be hidden. Everything will be examined, laid out there, and they will have for the opportunity for themselves to review the evidence and determine that God had done everything possible to save the lost. Which is, and the obvious follow-up question is, why is it important for that process to take place? Well, um, 
God wants to save. He's in the business of saving everyone. Mm. The gospel is, is going out. And remember the great controversies about vindicating the character of God. Satan has made an accusation against God, and God has allowed uh, the conflict, this universal conflict, to play out so that his character can be vindicated. And so the evidence must be, be laid bare um, so that every, every person who is not only saved, but those who are lost as well, there would be no opportunity to say that God was not fair and God was not just. And even for those who are saved, the redeemed, uh, they will need to examine that evidence so that they could see God's justice and God's love and so that they would never again choose the pathway of sin, mm -hmm. but would always choose to love and follow God throughout eternity. Which is very important that there's that Total finality, there's no doubt in anyone's mind. Any created being at that stage is going Correct. to doubt. Correct. Mm. Cassie, it eventually ends the thousand years. What happens then? Mm. Well, things happen to the wicked and to Satan. In Revelation 20, I'd like to read verse 7 and then I'll read 13. It says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And then 13, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works. So now we've come back to the earth again and the dead, which are only the wicked at this point as we've established are back to be with Satan. And perhaps this is why it's important for the 1000 years as well to take place before this, because now all of the redeemed who will witness this know that all oh, these people are truly the wicked who have chosen to side with Satan because these people now, now that Satan is released and they are with him, choose to follow him again. Yes, that's very powerful. Now, I just want to read um, from Revelation 21 and verse 2, and it says, <clears throat> And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the New Jerusalem had been the home of the redeemed for a thousand years, and now it's come down to earth. What does Satan do with all these wicked people, um, Uriah, with this new Jerusalem down on earth? It's, it's, it's quite interesting. Even at that last point, he still has, there's been no change. He doesn't give up. Evil still reigns in his heart. And in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 8 and 9, verse 7 tells us that he is released for a se season. And if verse 8 and 9 tell us what he will be up to. So this is after the thousand years. Uh, it says, and will go out to deceive the nations that word deceive, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up to the, on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So he is still up to his old tricks of deceiving. He's still trying to, you know, the people are still following him because they have followed him mm -hmm. uh, all their lives here on earth. And they are up to evil, but God finally uh, deals with them and um, they see their final end. They do, which, you know, the mind has, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, a, um, a picture of how many people that will be. It could be 100 billion people. All the people that ever lived are going to be in one place at one time. It could be a huge number of people. And most of those, the majority will be outside the city. What happens, Casey? Mm. Well, just mentioning the number of people there are, I'd like to turn to Romans 14 verses 11 and 12, because it says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. So we're about to find out what happens to them. But I'd like to just stop for a moment and think, hey, yes, every knee and every tongue, so all of these people every single one of them will also stand before God, which is mentioned back in Revelation 20. Uh, in verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. We've already talked about how the righteous have been judged and they have been redeemed. It's, of course, the wicked too meet their judgment. And this is the time for when that will happen. And the wicked 
bow the knee, that we can acknowledge that they are guilty. Yes, they do. So we have, all, all beings have, have acknowledged that God is just. Mm. So you write, you know, the redeemed and the heavenly host have seen the records. Um, the wicked are surrounding the city. We have the final act, the culmination of the great controversy. Just talk us through that and the implications. I think there, there are three categories. There's God, there is the righteous, there's the wicked and, and, and the devil. And the character of every group will be fully revealed. Um, because remember the great controversy, Satan made this accusation of God against God's character. He's unjust, he's wicked, he's evil. And if you disobey him, he kills you. And God's character is, is vindicated through the process of the great controversy. But also Satan's evil nature is also fully revealed. Um, and, um, you know, just think of when the wicked who are following him at that last battle, when they are defeated, that they are saying that, look, obviously this guy is a loser. And the only thing for God, left for God to do is put an end to all of this. And in Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, then death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. Uh, this is the second death. And anyone found not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. That's the end of evil. And God is proven to be just and righteous. And there's not a single created being anywhere in the cosmos that has any doubt that God is love, that God is just, he's merciful, he's righteous, and sin will never rise again. That's very powerful. That is the vindication of God's character. Yes. And it really highlights that um, this great controversy, which has taken, what, six, at that stage, 7,000 years of a process, has finally come to an end. Well, the Bible promises that the great controversy, well, thank you for that, by the way. The Bible promises that great controversy ends in God's victory and the triumph of God's love. Scripture calls us to trust God and work with him for the salvation of as many people as possible. We are to tell of his love dying on the cross, paying the price of our sins. And we are to share he gives power to walk with him victoriously today. And we will be then part of the redeemed on that resurrection morning. Praise God. Our highest hopes are in Christ. And if you have not already done so, accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour today. Well, we're glad you joined us on Let God Speak. Remember, all past programs plus teacher's notes are available on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Email us on lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. .org.au. Join us again next time. We look forward to being with you again as we start a new series. And God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.